finish very quickly something that I started doing yesterday. Uh, very briefly go over uh, some review of dark energy, and then I'll start proper going into large-scale structure, describing some of the objects and tools that we're going to start using. So I'm, I'm going to spend about half an hour talking about uh, stuff that I was supposed to talk yesterday, but I didn't have time because I was too ambitious about this. So just to finish some discussion that started actually yesterday with lots of uh, interesting discussions here about the Hubble parameter, which is still after almost, well, almost 100 years, coming to 100 years in a few years, but uh, the Hubble parameter is still not settled. It's still a major source of uncertainty and also a major uh, source of, a uh, major place where we, can, we are still doing active research today. So let's start with um, how Hubble did it uh, by using Cephades, which are standard stars, stars for, uh, whose absolute luminosities we infer from some data. So basically, we measure the distance using parallax to nearby cephates. And then we use their um, periods of uh, pulsation to establish a relation between the pulsation and the magnitude. And then we use that to measure distances to farther away uh, places. And one of the key places in this distance ladder, we jump from one place to the next, and then from that to the next distant place, and so on. Uh, one of the key places to look at is the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is this uh, dwarf galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. Now, Hubble started doing this, and this is the plot that he created here, and he generated the Hubble Lemaitre law, basically. Uh, he made a mistake there with the calibration of the Cephades, and he came out with a Hubble parameter of 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. It was a problem with the calibration. This just tells you how easy it is for you for you to get something systematically wrong. This was a systematic effect. The curve is still pretty much the same. Uh, now we can, do, we can do better to uh, larger distances and so on. Uh, and we can do the calibration better. So most of the research is, doing, is, is, is being conducted on having this uh, interval here uh, between zero and a few hundred megaparsecs distance which is where we can, see, we can still see cephates to this distance here, to these uh, to, uh, you know, tens of megaparsecs away from us, because they are, cephates are really bright stars. Um, so this is where, this is where uh, Hubble made his plot, now with only cephates and with the right calibration. Uh, so this is how you get the difference between uh, what we know now and what he had then. So it's not that much different, if, in fact. Um, okay, so, sorry, before I, uh, before I go ahead, uh, what we should know is that the same techniques that Hubble started using then, enriched by now type 1a supernovas, which are calibrated to the local cephids and other variable stars, uh, now, and I'm talking about now really, <laughs> like last year, this year, there was a paper just a few weeks ago by... Uh, by Adam Rees and collaborators. Uh, and the latest, latest number that they have, and they are really confident on the calibration and all the techniques that they're using to analyze the cephates, that this age not, so it's direct measurement using these variable stars, using that absolute relative magnitude relation that I showed you yesterday, it comes to 74 minus plus or minus 1.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that's the best fit for this law there. So it's really low redshift. It's basically, the data is really coming from redshifts below 0.1 pretty much. Um, and I'll tell you in a second why this is both interesting. Well, first of all, you see that it's about 2% error, right? 74 plus or minus 1.4 is, I guess, something like 2% errors, which is really amazing. Uh, considering that 10 years ago, this was much more like 5%. So this was uh, basically a combination of better data. Hubble Space Telescope dedicated a lot of time for this campaign. A lot of parallaxes were measured. The uncertainties in peculiar velocities and, um, and, uh, and the motions of stars uh, th th that were resolved also. So lots of factors that I really am not the best person in the world to tell you about. Let me tell you about a different way of measuring 
the Hubble parameter, which, is, uh, which refers to different objects and different redshifts and so on, the idea is that you have lensing uh, happening uh, by, for instance, a very massive galaxy here. Let me use this here. So you have a galaxy here, have a source in the background, something which is very far away and very bright, like a quasar, a point source, ideally. And it's strongly lensed by this galaxy here. So it means that you, what, when you have strong lensing, you see multiple images. And he, you see these crosses. These are called crosses. When you have quadruple images of something in the background, typically that something is a quasar. And you, have, and you see these four sources here. Now, what you have to realize is that each path, that each one of those images that you see here, they are different. And some of them take a little bit longer than others. So the light, as it travels along this path and this path, it takes a little bit longer in one than it takes in the other. So what you can do is that you can, so how, but how, by how much is this delay? So if something happens, quasars are not like a fixed star. Quasars, they oscillate. Their luminosity goes up and down. They, they are brighter at some time, and then some cloud of gas falls into the, um, into the um, accretion disk of the, of, the, of the black hole there in this quasar, and then it gets brighter, and then it gets fainter again. So it, it oscillates in some very erratic way, but the point is that it oscillates. Now, how long, suppose that you, a, a quasar, so suppose that this quasar here blips. So it has a, some luminosity and then it has a larger luminosity and then falls back down. So this is, happens at some time. How long does it take for you to see in this image and then in that image? What is the time delay? Of course, how long it takes. It takes billions of years to get from there to here. But the difference in time between those two paths, what is it? Typically, this is a few months. Okay? For some systems, it can be if, as short as you know, a month or so, but in many cases, it's many months. So, you don't know when a quasar is going to suffer this kind of effect, right? You don't know when this is going to happen. So, what you have to do is that you have to follow up the luminosity of those quasars over many, many years. And uh, some teams are being, have been doing this for a, for a while. And the point is that um, you can infer what is the Hubble parameter uh, based on this. It's not a trivial thing to see how this happens. Maybe Tim Eifler here, when he talks about lensing, can explain this. But, uh, but the, the paths and the time, so you can imagine that timing, uh, something is equivalent to also measuring the expansion rate. So you can infer the Hubble parameter based on these, uh, on these time delays of quasars. It has some uncertainties because you have to model the lens. That means that, that galaxy, which is here, uh, well, so there is some uncertainty here, sure. But it's a completely independent way of measuring the Hubble parameter. I'm not going to describe how this is done. I don't even think I know exactly uh, all that goes into it. But it's basically measuring how uh, having a model of this source, knowing the redshift of the source and of the lens, and then inverting for this uh, time delay, which depends on h naught. Now, when they measure this, and this is a paper also from this year, Wong et al. So this is Vivian Bonvin. I thought it was Camille Bonvin, but it's not Camille. Camille is some, somebody else. So there's Vivian and Camille. They're not related, are they, Philippe? I don't think so. Anyway, so these guys here, they are called Holy Cow Project. So this is, uh, they, follow up, they have been following up five systems, I think, for many years. And they come out with a number which is pretty much consistent with what the local guys have been measuring here, which is about 74 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. So you would think, OK, so this is more or less settled. This is within the margin of error. So it should be around that much, right? Remember that uh, this measurement here is, used, is, is done using very low redshift objects, 0.1 and below. This one here is using a variety of things. Uh, the, the lenses here, which are the most important for, uh, for the different, difference in paths of these objects, uh, they are at much higher redshift than 0.1. They are 0.5, 0.7, something 
something like this. So it's much higher redshift. So you would say, okay, so this is a consistent test, test right? There's another way that people have been thinking about measuring the Hubble parameter, and this, ha this is related with, with, the, uh, with the phenomenon of uh, two years ago that everybody uh, heard about, the uh, merger of the neutron stars, and here is the blip of the LIGO there, and the merger of the two neutron stars creating a big explosion and then a final black hole at the end. Um, we will come back to this many times. Now, for the context of H0, what, uh, what, you can, uh, what you should know is that when you have a black hole emitting, uh, or you have a compact object here uh, spiraling towards each other, uh, you know this is a very robust result from, uh, from uh, general relativity, and it's actually robust even to changes in rel general relativity that you know based on this graph here of the frequency of the wave that you capture on Earth that you can infer based on the amplitude of the waves what, uh, what was the uh, magnitude of those waves that were emitted there. So the masses of the particles, how close they were, and so on. It's like you would know just from looking at this, you would know the absolute magnitude of this source here. It's basically, that's the idea. You can infer from this curve here, the absolute magnitude of the, not light, but the gravitational radiation that's, in, that's, um, that's ejected by this, uh, by this spiraling pair. What you don't know exactly is whether the pair is spiraling with an angle with respect to you. That angle you don't know very well. And as you know from, for instance, electromagnetism, the radiation is not exactly isotropic when you have, you know, you have the oscillating dipole in electromagnetism. It's not really, uh, it's not really isotropic. If you look straight at the dipole, you see zero radiation. If you see, if you see, uh, if you look at it on the perpendicular direction, you see a large, you see uh, uh, some amount of radiation. For gravitational radiation, it's not exactly like this. You see radiation both uh, along the line of, uh, along the, the axis of the uh, of the spiraling and perpendicular to it, so there is some uncertainty in this. So basically, uh, you can also measure by using this absolute relative magnitude, so the amplitude of the gravity waves that you measure on Earth versus the amplitude of the gravitational waves that you expect that were, was generated at the source, and you can infer the Hubble parameter from this, just, by, just like you do for stars, using that distance modulus, that luminosity distance, and so on. However, there's an uncertainty related here with the angle that this uh, source um, has with us, right? So here is the value of H0. So the, the curves here are the values of H0 that you are uh, inferring from the, from the merger of the two neutron stars. And, but it mixes up with the angle that you have here. So this is the cosine of the angle that you have of the plane of the spiral. Here. So for one system, this measurement is not so good. Here, comparing you, what you have here is the measurement from the local measurement. So this is the 2008 result still. Uh, actually, this is 2017 result from this uh, Hubble Space Telescope campaign. And this is the measurement that we have from, from uh, CMB. More about this in a second. Uh, and of course, this one measurement based on one merger of neutron stars is still very uncertain. However, it's also completely independent of the others, and it's very much free of systematics in the same way that the others are. Uh, you don't have to model any kind of lens. You don't have to model the, uh, you don't have to calibrate your cephates or supernovas. This is a completely independent way of measuring. It comes again, ballpark in the place where you expect, of course, with a large uncertainty. But the point is that this is one event. Can you imagine what's going to happen when you have 100 events, when LIGO goes through the second phase, when we start seeing neutron stars every year, many of them, right? So this is going to, this measurement here based on neutron star mergers in a few years, perhaps by the time you finish your PhDs or by the time of your postdoc or whatever, this measurement here will be competitive with the other ones. So we will, be have, a, we will have a third way fourth way, whatever, of checking whether the Hubble parameter is really here or there. Now, from this plot here, you can already see that there's a tension here. 
So the two standard more, let's say, standard ways of measuring the Hubble parameter is on one hand using the CMB, and Cora Dvorkin is going to talk more about this, how you measure the Hubble parameter from the CMB, and the measurement comes up to be here, so it's below 70, around 68 or so, with this very small error bar. And the other measurements, uh, cepheids and supernovas, uh, follow-up of time delay of quasars, they come around this place here, and this is a significant disagreement. We call this tension. Things don't match, right? Uh, okay, so uh, these plots are kind of small here, but there is a problem with the Hubble parameter. Um, uh, you don't have to focus on this here for now, but focus on the lower plot here, okay? So the idea is that there are many ways that you can measure the Hubble parameter, uh, even in, uh, at higher redshifts. We will see in the lectures about large-scale structure and structure formation that you can use structure formation and the clustering of galaxies, specifically these baryon acoustic oscillations, to measure distances both across and along the line of sight. And measuring distances along the line of sight is equivalent to measuring the Hubble constant. Why this is, I should just tell you because it's so simple. You remember that this commoving uh, distance is basically dt over a, right? Now, this is, you can also write this as, uh, I, as dt dA dA 1 over a, right? So this is 1 over a. So this is integral dA over a dot a, right? And this is integral dA over a squared times h, right? And this is basically turns out to be integral dz over h. Now, if I really put things with the right constants, because I'm using c is equal to 1, I really should put c here in front of everything. So, OK, so your radial distance is c times integral dz over h, h of z here, OK? Now, you can imagine that you have, let's say, you, have, you are here on Earth, right, observing two galaxies, which are, let's say, one is here and one is there, here, okay? So this is chi 1, this is chi 2, and what is d chi? d chi here is c dz over h of z, okay? So let's say you put a z average here. So measuring along the line of sight, something, right, the distances along the line of sight. So if you have an idea, if you have a, a typical distance for galaxies along the line of sight, you measure this redshift. If you know this distance, you can infer what age of z is. Simple, right? So this is what we can do, actually, and you will learn about this later. So this is what is in this plot here. It's how we can measure the Hubble parameter here, scale by 1 plus z in this case here, but that's the Hubble parameter in this plot using clustering of galaxies as measured by, in this case, BOSS. That's Sloan Digital Sky Survey. There are many more surveys that do this, okay? But this is the one that we want to focus here. And in, uh, and in gray here is the, uh, what you would expect from using the standard model that you get from the CMB. This thing is also searching for me like crazy. I should warn the lady there that... Uh, uh, here. Hello. Yes. <laughs> now, I, now I should stop this. Otherwise, it's okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, You keep the mic and then pass it to somebody else. Uh, okay. Uh, so, in order to get the Hubble parameter, we need the redshift and the independent way of measuring the distance. How how do we get this distance? I, how you get the, the distance? Uh, yeah. How we get the decay? Yeah. Right. So that's what we're going to see. I'll I'll, I'll oh. summarize it to you. But basically, uh, we. When we look at the physics of the 
uh, of the baryons and photons and dark matter in the early universe. Oh, there you go again. This thing is looking for me. No, I, I was leaving it on, but it was still going like crazy. No, no, no. It, still on, it was going like this. So, uh, so when you look at the physics of baryons and photons and dark matter in the early universe, you see that there are these, there is a scale that shows up. I'm going to show this later, okay? Uh, that's called the baryon acoustic oscillation scale. Mm. And this is um, uh, it's basically independent of H naught. Um, well, it's not truly totally independent, but it's robust against changes in H naught. So basically, you have a scale that you know it's going to appear later. So basically, there's a preferred distance between pairs of galaxies. Uh, so I'll okay. talk about this in a second, okay? Yeah. okay, okay. Uh, but there is a scale that shows up in the distance between pairs of galaxies. Of course, where a galaxy is in the universe is totally random. There's no preferred places. Mm -hmm. But when you look at a galaxy and you ask, what is the likelihood that you're going to have a galaxy at a certain distance, there is a particular distance which, which comes up, which mm. is a bit more likely to have pairs of galaxies in that distance. So you have a, you have a, a standard ruler, oh, okay. in, if, you, if you will. Okay. Yeah. So you have this here. You measure that. You infer that. Right? So that's the idea. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so you can not only use clustering of galaxies, you have also to use BAO to combine yes, information. Yes, clustering <laughs> with BAO. So you measure the clustering, you use BAOs. That b The BAOs are the character characteristic scale that you're using. Okay. That's what allows you to have this here. I'm going to show you, in a, hopefully, in this lecture here, uh, how this is. Okay. Yes. So my question is related to how you, uh, how do you define the luminosity distance when you have non-isotropic emission for those sources? Because it looks to me that when you defined it yesterday, you had to use a source that emits light isotropically, right? I don't understand. What do you mean? How can I define what? As a, uh, the luminosity so distance. So the, the idea is that the, the large scale, on, on very large scales, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, and apart from small corrections to typical velocities, uh, the galaxies are following the Hubble flow. This is all that we are assuming. No, no. The luminosity distance, yeah. when you define it, do you have to assume that the, the source emits isotropically? Light is coming in all directions equally. Because ah. you, you talked Sorry. about this emission. The source, if the source is emitting isotropically yes. for the luminosity distance, uh, well, in principle, if you have some, uh, ma the magnitude is assuming uh, that, it, that it is isotropic. Now, notice that here, in this case here, it, it, really, uh, it really is not, it's, it's nothing like this. It's, this. This has nothing to do with luminosity distance, this measurement here. This is directly the commoving distance. So it doesn't even involve that. So if you, if you want to step back now and look at what's happening with the luminosity distance measurements of, say, cepheid supernovas, or even the gravity waves, yes, you have to take into account if the, if the source is not um, isotropic, yes. So if it is an isotropic, then you have to correct for whatever angle factors you have. But that's a, OK? It's just because it looks to me a little bit weird when you define a luminosity distance and the source is not emitting isotropically because it's focused. No, but that's a trivial thing to correct. I mean, if you know what is the luminosity in your direction, then you can correct for that factor. It's just an angle factor, right? So it's a cosine square, typically. Or something else if you have some other source. It's totally trivial to correct. There's no, there's no problem with this. Of course, it's just a question of, you know, it's not emitting isotropically, then you just have to multiply or divide by a factor in that direction. That's the origin of the error bar in the question of theta. Yeah. Angle that they this is exactly that yeah. factor here in that source. Now, for a star like a Cepheid variable, the, the source, people have models for this, physical models, and we know that they are isotropic. So it doesn't apply. For supernovas, it's not so trivial to know, but again, there's no evidence there's any, that there is any anisotropy. It has never, has never been observed. But then it's a factor that you can take into account, right? So all right, so here is what you would have if you would have basically the cosmology that you get from CMB propagated into the future up to today. So this is right here today. Now, here is the measurement that we're having from 
cephids and supernovas at low redshifts, and also from time delay of quasars. Whew, so there's a problem there. Again, the, 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 um, the uh, gravity wave um, measurement is confirming. It's, it's, it's really not, not confirming, but it's, it's in the middle there somewhere, but it's still uncertain. But we have a big tension here. What's going on? So um, could it be that something is happening here, low redshifts? However, we also have low redshift measurements of these distances here, redshift 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Uh, the quasar uh, time delay measurement is not really at redshift zero. I, I don't know exactly what redshift it is, but there is, a, there is a problem here. OK, guys? There is a significant problem, and we don't know what it is. It's, it's uh, let's say, not as hard of a problem, not as big a, of a problem as dark energy is, but it is a problem there. And we're going to hear more about this. Uh, although probably no solution because I haven't heard of anybody coming up with a final solution for this. Um, anyway, so the universe expands and that's it. Now, let me go over to uh, some slides about dark energy and just review quickly uh, what's going on here. Uh, so I'm skipping here a bunch of discussions about dark matter, which I had here which are in my slides if you want to take a look at it, but I won't have time to go into this. Uh, so let's see. So basically, everybody is familiar with the story that you know, up until basically when I was uh, on my first postdoc, everybody thought that the universe was, uh, had some sort of inflation here. Then it ex expanded in a decelerating way. So it's basically like this. Okay. So basically, we knew that the universe was basically flat that it was decelerating for most of its history and so on. But then these guys here, um, the, uh, a team started to analyze the, uh, the brightness of supernovas at different redshifts and how this, and they started to make basically the Hubble curve uh, for higher redshifts using supernovas. And they found out that the universe is actually accelerating, has been accelerating basically Half of its age was decelerating, and then the other half, from 7 billion years of age, pretty much, to now, it's been accelerating. Uh, and this is a problem now, because we don't have anything that we see that could cause this. Everybody knows the story about these guys. They got the Nobel Prize and so on. This is beyond any doubt now that the universe is accelerating. Every single piece of evidence that we have points to the fact that there is this acceleration happening. So this is not... This is not uh, in the realm of serious question anymore. So what is causing this acceleration? So um, of course, this is a problem because gravity should attract things, not repel things. So it should slow down the expansion. So even if you have some initial expansion, the gravity should be pulling things apart. However, what's happening is that over the, uh, over the last 7 billion years or so, it's been accelerating. OK, so every single piece of evidence that we have points to this acceleration. Nothing is, is inconsistent with that. Explanations for this acceleration uh, are mostly into two categories. Um, first, that there is another uh, source. There is another type of matter energy out there, uh, something we call dark energy, that started to dominate the universe. And this has a negative pressure. Uh, an equation of state which is close to minus one or so. Okay, we don't know exactly the value of this, and this is called causing accelerating acceleration. However, it could also be that the Friedman equations, which we are assuming when we add this component here, right? The Friedman equations maybe they are behaving in some unexpected way. So maybe gravity itself is not really determined by general relativity, but on super large scales, these gravity is behaving differently. And we have never really tested gravity on such large scales. So we don't know that it should behave that way. We know gravity here on tabletop experiments. We know gravity in the solar system, pretty much. As you go out from there, it becomes a bit more iffy. We are not really so sure anymore. We just use gravity, and then we correct it with dark matter or dark energy when it fails, basically. OK? So we don't know. So we're not, we cannot be so sure. People are relatively sure that gravity is working like general relativity or Newtonian gravity, at least. 
in the scale of galaxies and clusters of galaxies because you know we can make many cross checks there and dark matter seems to be something that is really out there so this is not uh, modified theories of gravity that ex that explain away dark matter have really been basically uh, blown out now they are not seriously taken into account nowadays but for dark energy it's still something that you can think about uh, changing gravity on large scales. Okay, so what's happening right now is that despite all of these models, despite all of these different attempts, the standard uh, simplest way, most simplistic way to explain this acceleration, with this, uh, which is Einstein's cosmological constant, is still the one that is most consistent with data, apart from really tiny details. You know, really, we have sometimes a theory which is just a little bit better fits the data, but it's so small the difference that really doesn't, it doesn't pass the test of uh, Occam's razor. So there are many different types of models that you will probably hear in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these lectures. Um, this is an old nomenclature here. Uh, people would refer to these models as scalar tensor, quintessence, quiescence, chameleons, modified gravity, blah, blah, blah. Nowadays, it's more fashionable to talk about different ways of referring to these modified gravity models. You have these Horn-Desk or Galilean theories. You have something which is even more general. You have this thing called the effective field theory approach. You have these Proca models. So there's a large class of models. And uh, as data becomes better, we are, ref we are eliminating more and more these models. And uh, we are uh, being better at, uh, at constraining parameters. And as we do this, lambda is still the best explanation. Uh, let's just remember that lambda is a big, big problem because it's, a, it's such a small constant. It's a small constant. It's such a small constant that it's tens of orders of magnitude, magnitudes away from any known physical constant of the standard model of particle physics. So uh, it, it doesn't matter how you frame this if you want to refer lambda to uh, grand unified theory uh, vacuum energy or uh, electroweak vacuum energy, it doesn't matter how you do this, it's still tens of orders of magnitude away from the l smallest physical constant that you can imagine here. So it's a problem, but we don't know how to go get away from lambda, and, and uh, observations, they, they go that way. So basically, just to remember, just to remind you, what is the picture here? If we have general relativity or something which is similar to it, then we need about 70% of the universe today being made up of dark energy. Visible matter is about 5%. Dark matter is about 25%. If we have modified gravity to explain acceleration, then we have about 84% dark matter and 16% of, um, of visible matter. So visible matter is very, a very small component. Okay, So that's something you have to keep in mind. Baryonic matter, visible matter, no matter how you describe uh, the universe and also large-scale structure, it is a sub subdominant component. Okay, gravitationally speaking, is a subdominant component. Of course, when you talk about photons and baryons and so on, photons don't interact with dark matter. So many physical processes they only see the baryons. However, you have you can you should never forget that dark matter is still there, and it's not really it's being kind of invisible to both baryons and and uh, photons, but it's there. Uh, so basically, this is, uh, this, is a, this is a very old plot, but it's still a very good one. This is how you write Friedman, Friedman's equations here with the total energy here of all the components. Okay. So basically, what we have is that we have cold dark matter and baryons here summed in this part here, and the energy in whatever dark energy or lambda, if you want, here. And these are some constraints. This is very old. This is more than 10 years old, but this is a very illustrative plot that shows you how the CMB constrains these two parameters, OK? Here on this line, the sum of them would be 1. So this would be basically uh, a flat universe here. k would be 0. CMB is along here. Supernovas, they constrain you in this region, and large-scale structure in that region. And all of them, they zoom in in that region there. So this is a more modern plot. Now it tells this plot is. Uh, about the amount of acceleration, how fast you are accelerating. And in this model here, you are generalizing the notion of uh, some sort of a dark energy through an equation of state here, so P over rho, 
which is a constant plus some term which varies with the scale factor here. So this is a, let's say, if this, if this guy here is zero, then this guy is a, then uh, the equation of state is just this w zero here, okay? But, uh, but you allow for some variation. So this is how people have been searching phenomenologically for uh, deviations from lambda, because lambda has to have this term zero, and the w zero equals to minus one. Anything away from that would be indications that dark energy is not given by a cosmological constant, that we really have another field, uh, dynamical field in the universe. And here is what you get by combining, uh, if you just have CMB, you have, uh, you have this basically huge uncertainty. And the reason for this is that the CMB, is, the cosmic microwave background, is something that happens at very high redshifts. It doesn't really tell you too much about the universe at low redshifts, and dark energy is a recent low redshift effect. So the CMB is not very good at constraining this. Uh, when you combine that with uh, large-scale structure, that's BAO and supernovae, and also when you include uh, what we call redshift space distortions, the picture gets a little bit better, and you get, uh, you get a region which is over here, but again, Lambda is smack there in the middle of this region, so it's still the preferred, let's say, it's, it is still the model to beat, if you want. Um, well, how about the other explanation in terms of modifi modifications of gravity? Now, of course, you can get the same amount of acceleration by changing the equations, okay? Either in this way here or in this way. Yes? It would change, I think it would change a bit, but, uh, but not too much. Uh, you can ask the, the, the reverse question, what about uh, allowing for dark energy? Does that resolve the tension of H0? You, that's, a, that's a question you can ask also. And we were having exactly this discussion yesterday. And there's a student here that has a paper exactly on this. David there, so you can talk to him later. So as I understand your paper and other papers in this, it doesn't help you too much if you allow for dark energy equation of state. You still have that tension, right? Yeah, at least if you consider the cosmic variable, which are particularly in the supernova, used to be to constrain the causal tension between the cosmic there is not a huge effect in the final result. So, so the tension is still there. Yeah. So dark energy doesn't solve the tension of H0. In fact, these guys show that it, it even makes it slightly worse because you, you move slightly yeah. away, right? Because Just slightly. Yeah, there's many analysis of other risks include that the uh, acceleration parameter is fixed mm -hmm. and the value of the lambda CM. So, but if you consider that this parameter is fixed, you get even a more uh, value for the H0. Yeah. So basically, uh, WA and W0, they translate in, in cosmography into this deceleration parameter. So have, have, allowing the deceleration parameter to vary is the same thing as allowing these parameters to vary. So um, it seems that these two, uh, these two, uh, that this uh, H0 is really talking to this factor here of equation of state too much. I mean, it is, certainly you cannot solve the H0 problem by by doing something, uh, by allowing for um, acceleration in different ways than lambda, okay? Okay, uh, so again, how can you then obtain acceleration without having some dark energy? Well, we need to change in some way Friedman's equations, either on the right-hand side by adding some component or on the left-hand side by changing the dynamic equations. And this you can do, okay? There's infinite ways in which you can do this. You can get exactly the same acceleration as you get in a model with dark energy, in a model with modified gravity. Now, uh, the, what happens, however, when you, when you do something like this, is that you change a series of equations, not only the Friedman equations. In particular, you change the equations that tell you how matter moves under gravitational fields, or how the gravitational fields um, uh, respond to some matter. So basically, 
uh, this is the simplest way in which you can see this here. So if you have a modification of gravity here by, for instance, including a eisner hilbert action, which is not the Ricci scalar, but some function of the Ricci scalar, then the Poisson equation is not just given by this, but it gets a correction here. So for the same matter, you have a different gravity, a different response to gravity. So you have the you have gravitational potentials behave differently, if you will. So by doing this here, you also change the regime of structure formation. So this is a very interesting way of checking whether the cosmic acceleration is coming from dark energy, which doesn't change this equation here, or from modified gravity that changes this equation and changes the regime of large-scale structure of structure formation, okay? So that's a very hot topic of uh, research, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to this, probably not myself, but uh, either Rogério or, um, or Marco later on. Um, I'm almost done here with dark energy, so let me just see here. Oh, yes. Uh, what are these theories, modified theories of gravity? There are many, many different, um, there he goes again. So there are many different uh, um, flavors of this. One of the flavors that you can imagine is that you can have a Lagrangian here uh, that describes the gravitational sector and also your matter, uh, which is a completely general thing. This is called horn desk. It was, this, it was invented, was derived in 73, and then it was forgotten, and then it was reinvented independently by these guys here, and then, the, and then it was realized that these guys just reinvented something that was known from 30 years ago. Well, so you have many different terms here that you, that you are allowed to have if you uh, if you have this, uh, um, if you don't, if you if you forbid the appearance of instabilities, you know, dynamical instabilities. Um, so, including this term here, which is which is uh, erased here, uh, this is a, a possibility. All of these terms you can include in your action. Uh, now, physics is all one big thing, right? You just don't look at one experiment and ignore everything else that happens. And what happened also as a result of the, of the, uh, of the neutron star uh, observation was that, as you, as you know, the neutron star, uh, neutron star merger was observed because we saw not only the chirp there from on LIGO, the gravitational wave signal, but we also saw a small uh, burst of gamma rays that was detected by the Fermilat uh, satellite. And it was the conjunction of those two that allowed us to pinpoint the region of around 50 square degrees in the sky where that event should have taken place. And then half the telescopes on Earth started to point in, in that direction, and they detected the optical glow of the merger of those two neutron stars. OK? OK, so that's why we actually were able to use those neutron stars, because otherwise we wouldn't know where the source came. If we just had the gravitational wave signal, we wouldn't know where it came from, and we wouldn't know the redshift. Okay? So it's only the electromagnetic signal that allowed you to have the redshift, but it also allowed you to ask the following question. When I get the signal from the gravitational waves and I get the signal from the photons of the final merger, what is the delay between those two signals? Because that tells you how fast the gravitational waves travel and how fast the photons travel. Now, in these theories here, what happens is that this term here affected the speed of the gravitational waves which wasn't the, uh, the, the speed of light anymore, but it was slightly, could be smaller. Now, because we are talking about an, uh, an event that happened, you know, I think it was redshift, uh, I think this, this, uh, the source was 300 megaparsecs away. Can you, anybody remi remember what is, the what is the distance to the neutron star, neutron star merger? Anybody remember this number, 300 megaparsecs, ring the bell? I think it was 300 megaparsecs, so that's a billion years. So you're talking about a billion years, a billion light years away, and you're talking about signals that arrived on Earth within less than, within a second or so of each other, okay? So we know that the speed of light and the speed of gravitational waves have to be the same, basically. We know that the speed of gravitational waves has to be basically the speed of light. And this eliminates that term there from, these, uh, <laughs> from, these, uh, from this type of Lagrangian. So, you know, by looking at physics and looking at different tests, we can also come down and say, okay, the theory of gravity, no matter what's, what's going on, it has to obey physics. So uh, by combining different observations, we can narrow down the 
let's say, the, total, the, the complete set of models that we could cook up in our dreams, if you want. So how do we test uh, for dark energy? How have we been doing this? Uh, how we will probably do this in the next few years? Um, mostly by looking at things like supernovas, clustering of galaxies and Marian acoustic oscillations by looking, measuring uh, how many groups and clusters there are out there, their masses and so on, and also by measuring gravitational lensing. Uh, I'll be talking here about this topic here, okay? And I'll give you just a very quick flavor of the stuff that we're going to see, okay? You are, you are all familiar with these curves here of the acoustic peaks of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, tomorrow, or maybe even today, depending on how we go, I'll show you how, this, how, this, uh, how these peaks here are really a scale that's imprinted on the distribution of, not only in the distribution of the radiation there, but also in the distribution of matter. So basically, there, are, there is a correct characteristic characteristic scale that's imprinted on matter in the universe, in the radiation, in the baryons. And uh, this scale is in, is in there, basically the harmonics of that scale, of that acoustic scale. And we search for that in the distribution of matter. So basically we expect that there is a scale here, a typical scale that gets imprinted all the way from the CMB up to today. That scale is about 150 megaparsecs. Okay, we look for that scale in the clustering of galaxies. How do we do the clustering? Basically, this is the idea. And this is, how, this is basically the idea that we, we're going to have to work with from now on. Suppose in blue here is the matter field that you, suppose that you could see the matter field. So baryons, dark matter, every, everything together. Suppose that you see, uh, the, it's almost a continuous field, right? I mean, there are probably particles in the end, but you can look at them as a fluid, as a continuous field here. So the brighter regions are the dense regions. The dark regions are the under-dense regions. And if we look at this structure, hidden in this structure, there are scales, there are physical processes happening. And it is our role to understand how this structure statistically behaves, how, what is the statistics of this structure, of course, there's no significance to this place having less density than that place and so on, but there is significance of the fact that you have a dense region here, a dense region there, a dense region there, and they have some distance with respect to each other. This is not only a question of how the initial conditions for the density field were, and this is the realm of the lectures of uh, Merdad, which is back there, okay? But it's also uh, a question of how, that in how those initial conditions evolved with time because gravity pulls things together. So an overdense region, for instance, this one, initially wasn't so much more dense than the other regions. Because it was initially more dense, it attracted matter from the vicinities, and then it became more dense and more dense with time. So this process is happening continuously, and it is our role, it's, it is our duty now to understand how this goes on from some initial conditions and describe this and see how we can extract those that physics and those scales in particular from these kinds of maps. Now, how do we do this? And this is, going, this is, this is what I'm going to be talking about here in the, next, uh, uh, in the next part here, which I'm going to go to the blackboard, is basically by measuring the distances between those, these objects and doing what we call correlations, either in real space like I'm doing here, okay? So we measure the correlation function. I'm going to explain to you what, exactly what it is now, okay? And then you do this, or Alternatively, what you can do, and I'll explain also here in the next, uh, in, in the next uh, half an hour or so, you can do this in Fourier space. So basically, you take this into Fourier space and you make the correlations of the amplitudes of the Fourier modes, and then you get what we call a power spectrum here. So basically, our role is try to understand, so there's a scale here that you see here, that's the scale that you asked about. There's a preferred scale here in the correlation function. And that scale translates into these oscillations here, which you can see here in the power spectrum, and that's what we want to measure. There's a, uh, we know what that scale has to be from the CMB, and we measure this scale on the clustering of galaxies uh, in the universe. Now, of course, we have to use galaxies because we don't really see this blue stuff that I have in this plot here. This is all the matter. We don't see dark matter directly. 
we just see baryonic matter. However, we believe, and there is very good reason for this, both in terms of analytic uh, approximations and in simulations, that the baryons, they, to a very good degree, follow the total field of matter. Uh, so we, call, we, we say that galaxies here, they are like, uh, uh, they are like um, a sign that in a given place there is more density. Of course, you don't have a galaxy in the middle of a place where the, the density is basically zero. Okay, so you only have galaxies in over-dense regions of the universe. So basically, you use galaxies to trace the total matter field and the dark matter field, and we use the galaxies to find the correlations between those over-dense regions. So that's the idea, okay? All right, uh, I think this is it for now, and I'm going to go to the blackboard now um, and say a few things there. Uh, let me just... Uh, Getting hot here. So, any questions uh, as I undress here? Yes. <clears throat> um, uh, do you use um, modified gravity only at? large scales or that's a good question scales? so when you do a theory of modified gravity you should take care that you don't destroy uh, what's happening on small scales on solar system and our galaxies and so on it doesn't it doesn't really help too much if you in order to explain something you unexplain something else right so for a good theory of modified gravity you have to make sure that there are there, there are mechanisms that protect gravity on small scales, or let's say let Earth solar system scales, okay? So this is a delicate issue, actually. So many of these models, they have many of these uh, modified gravity models, they have what the, 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 these mechanisms that protect gravity such that on, let's say, a region like the solar system, it still behaves pretty much like GR or Newtonian gravity, right? In, in the solar system, GR is a very small correction to Newtonian physics. Even in galaxy scales, GR and Newtonian physics are very, very similar. You don't have really, uh, you don't really go too far away from the non-relativistic regime, right? So uh, there are mechanisms called the chameleon mechanism, for instance, that uh, uh, which uh, which is a way to uh, ensure that on in a region where the density is high enough, let's put it like this, that you that the modifications of gravity are, uh, are uh, they are pushed out, so so that in the end you end up with the gravity that you already know works here. Of course, you cannot change the Poisson equation here; otherwise, everything goes to hell, right? Uh, the orbits of the planets, everything doesn't work, right? So you have to be careful that the modifications of gravity do not change the gravity on small scales. Yes, you have to be uh, in the model building. You have to put that ingredient in there. And sometimes this is, uh, this is a bit non-trivial. And um, I have another question. Um, does it exist? Maybe it sounds uh, a little bit weird. Uh, like dark uh, general relativity that explains dark matter and dark energy. I don't understand the question. Um, Can you say again? Does it exist something called dark a general relativity that explains dark energy, dark matter? I don't know what, this, what you mean. Dark, cold, dark general relativity? I don't know what that means. Uh, for, like re, uh, general relativity that uh, Einstein's, that um, the, the, the relation of, of, of um, energy and matter, but uh, just dark. Um, is it, if there's a relation between dark energy or with uh, dark matter. You're asking if there is a relation between dark energy and dark matter? Is yes, that the question? and if, if, does, if there's uh, something like general relativity, but dark. 
I really don't see a question there. I think we should discuss later, okay? I don't, I don't really, don't, I don't, so let, let me understand the first, let, let me ask, answer the first question, otherwise the second question, I don't even understand what it is. Okay. The first question about dark matter and dark energy, uh, in principle, there's no relationship. We don't see any. Uh, there are many papers about uh, interactions between dark matter and dark energy, but there is very little evidence. I, even I have a paper about this kind of thing, but the evidence is very flimsy, very, there's no indication of this. Besides, we know the dark matter had to be there on the epoch of the formation of the CMB, so that's Redshift 1000, when dark energy was most likely not there, although you know, we could cook up models where the dark energy is, is um, even active at high redshifts, but it's mostly a low redshift effect, so there's no reason to think that they are, the two are related. So they, they act on completely different ways. Dark matter is confined to gravitationally bound structures to the most part, for the most part, so galaxies, galaxy clusters, and so on. And dark energy, no. Whatever dark energy it is, it is not gravitationally bound around structures. It is really uh, almost homogeneous uh, component, okay? So, no, I, there's no indication that they are related. Of course, it would be wonderful if they were, but there are no indications, okay? Uh, now, for the second part of your question, I think we should talk later because I really don't understand what you're trying to say, okay? Um, all right, so... Um, so, what we are talking here is we will be talking about the density field a lot. And for the, for the most part, I will not be um, bothered with the difference between the density field and what we actually observe, which is galaxies. I'll just, for now, let's just assume that they are identified, that we somehow magically identify. So this, usually we denote by rho, as a function of x, but of course it is a function of t, but I'll be mostly concerned of how it is, how it is as a function of x. Uh, well, I'll be concerned with both of them, but let's say that we make a plot here of the density in a one-dimensional direction here, let's say x. So what do you expect the density to be? Of course, this has to be positive, okay? So this is rho of x for some y, fixed y, z, and t here, all right? So what is it? Well, it's something like this. Uh, it's like this. It has some peaks today. So, you know, that blue thing that I, that I showed you before, it looks like something like this, okay? So there are regions here where you have almost nothing. And there are some other regions here where you have a peak. This... So th these are two peaks here. So this is where we expect to see galaxies, okay, here, there, and there, and so on, right? So in some sense, uh, when we talk about large-scale structure, we are talking about where the galaxies are, but also where the galaxies are not, right? Because for, if you are condensing matter in a few regions and other regions are empty, the empty regions also have some uh, significance and some importance. Uh, usually we call these, these places, these vast places uh, where, you don't have, where, where you have very little, little matter as voids, uh, big places, big bubbles where you don't see any matter in there. Now, uh, how do we describe this? How do we start to describe this? So the, the universe was, wasn't always like this. In fact, if this was today, and if you ran this back into the past, so this is 2, 0, that's today. So if you ran this back into some initial moment, you know, at very, very high redshift in the beginning of the universe, this same plot here will be looking very much like this. So this is, so let me look at some t here. So this is rho bar of that t, so that's the mean density. And here by rho, I really mean row of matter, by the way. I'm going to drop the M from here, but every time that here I see row, I mean row of matter. I don't, re I, mean, I don't mean necessarily the total density, okay, because you also have radiation, also you have um, potentially dark energy and so on. But here, for the purposes of what we're doing, I'm assuming that we are anywhere between the, the epoch after the CMB and a redshift of, say, 1 when the universe was safely dominated by matter. So rho and rho matter are the same thing for all purposes, okay? That clear? 
Now, if you look at this now, you see, okay, these regions here, which are the peaks here, they were initially a little bit more over the more dense than the others, okay? Right? So if you look at what this field looked like, it was really something like this. So I'm just going to make this very small so that you have an idea. I'm, I'm trying really hard to make uh, OK? It really looks like something like this. Very, very small overdensities there that grew after billions of years to be something like this. As they did that, you see, if you calculate the mean density in this time here, it's really something like here. You see, this looks completely different from that, right? Now, how, this, how does this happen? This is what we're going to start to calculate here, OK? Of course, this went down. This went up. This went down. This went up. OK, so matter went from here. So basically, matter went from here to there, from here to there, and to there, from here to there and to there, and to there, and so on, making these peaks grow. And as, as a result, of course, because of conservation of matter, the places which were slightly under dense, like here, they were, so it, it doesn't appear here, so <laughs> I really should have drawn this these, uh, these places in between here as having slightly underdense here, right? Uh, so the underdense regions, they, they lost their matter to the overdense regions, and that's what's happening. So how do we describe this? So what we do is that we say that our rho of x and t is basically this mean density, which is the, so the mean it doesn't depend on space, right? It doesn't depend on position. It only depends on time. But the fluctuations here, so the variation from this mean here, we talk about this in terms of this delta rho of x and t. So of course, we know how this behaves. This is just Friedman's equations. We don't need to solve this. We know that, for instance, rho bar of t is equal to basically rho 0 times a to the minus 3, because matter goes like 1 over the volume. And this is what's happening. It's decaying. Uh, the density, the mean density, is just going down as 1 over the scale factor cube. So that's volume, right? So this is trivial. Now, this is the non-trivial part. And for this, we need to go beyond Friedman's equations. OK? so. Before we get to the equations, and b before we get to start, before we start playing with solving these equations, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about what some of the figures that I showed you here, and how we operate with those quantities here. Okay, so um, what is this? Uh, what are those correlation functions and power spectra that we are showing to you? What is it that we want to compute at the end of the day after we find some behavior for these guys here, OK, through some equations? All right? So what we do with it, I'm going to tell you this before we go on, because so that we, uh, so that we uh, get this out of the way. First of all, instead of talking about something which has dimensions, because of course, energy density, whether it is really energy density or mass density, it, it has units, right? Energy per unit volume or mass per unit volume. This is not something that's, uh, let's say, uh, comfortable to work with. So what we do is that we do we use something called a density contrast. And this has a very 
Unfortunate notation because this delta here is also the same notation for the Dirac delta, which appears a lot in these calculations. But uh, this delta here, which is delta rho over rho bar, so it is the fractional over density or under density. So if you write this guy here now, of course, you can write this and you can say that you know at your initial at your initial time. This is now something like this. It's both negative, it can be negative, right? This delta, because when it is, when you have a lower density than the, than the homogeneous background, then this delta rho is negative, and this delta is negative, of course, right? But what it cannot be, of course, is that this because rho cannot be negative, delta rho cannot be smaller than minus rho bar, of course. So this delta has to be larger or greater to minus and minus one. It's something that you have to keep in mind. So so there's a limit here in minus one that you cannot cross with this delta here. And this is something that you need to keep in mind as we start making some calculations here. So this delta is what we're trying to compute after, after all, because this is, so this is a function of position and time. And it obeys some equations that we can derive from general relativity typically, but we also can derive approximate equations just by looking at fluid equations, for instance. And this is, what we're going, this is the path that we're going to take here. OK, so let's say we have delta of x and t. What do we do with it? Because of course, again, um, there are some properties of this delta. Let's see. First of all, the mean, what is the mean of this delta? Spatially, I mean spatially, what is the mean of this delta? If I do a special average over a large volume, what is the mean of this delta? Zero, right? On average, you just have the average density. So on average, this high guy has to be zero, and therefore, on average, it, it's zero. So. This doesn't have a expectation value, if you want. It's zero expectation value. Now, of course, this means also that if you're talking about the statistics of that field, you're going to have to start with the second momentum of this distribution. So let's say that we have a variance. OK? Ah, so this is different than zero. And this is interesting, OK? If you can compute this, and if it's not, if it's not infinite for some reason, because you are, sometimes when you calculate these kinds of things, you can find some infinities that, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The mean in the spatial. So what, it, what do I mean by mean? Right here, in this context here, in space for delta of x and t, what I mean by mean of something is really 1 over v, integral over v, d3x of that thing. OK, here, this is what I mean. Now, when you go to Fourier space, I'll mean something else. But let's get there, and then we talk about this, OK? OK, so like I said, there's no, this is some sort of a, there's no, there's nothing in the information that in this region you have an overdense point, and in this region, we have an underdense point. This is just random things, we believe. And for the theory of the random initial conditions, again, refer to uh, Merdad's lecture. But of course, now, the way in which this variance, and in a more general sense, the, what, what we will call the correlation functions behave, this is where you find some physics, OK? OK, so now there are two ways of uh, describing this field, two ways of describing delta. 
Okay, so you can have either the field as a function of space, or you can also have the field in Fourier space, which is very often something we, ha we want to do. So uh, think about this as, uh, of these matter fluctuations, as something that obeys a wave equation or something that resembles a wave equation. As with any wave equation, you have these gradients and Laplacians in basically Euclidean space, okay? And then, of course, you don't want to be keeping these Laplacians up and down. You want to turn every nabla that you have, right, in uh, every nabla that you have into some i k, and then you, your equations become much simpler, especially if you're dealing with the linearized equations if your physics is linear. So this is a, these are two different ways of uh, regarding this problem. So we can talk about them uh, in terms of Fourier transforms. So this, we say, that is the inverse Fourier transform of this delta of k and t. And this is the Fourier transform, direct Fourier transform of delta of x and t. OK? So we can use both of these descriptions to, um, to, to say something about this field here. Uh, just notice here that because delta of x is real, then the reality conditions for this guy here implies that delta star of k t is equal to delta of minus k t, OK? Here, because if you take, of course, the uh, conjugate of this uh, expression, it's exactly equal to the same. This guy is real, so this guy has to ha obey this condition here. As you know from Fourier transforms of any real fields. Mm. OK, so the way in which you I'm probably overkilling this, but as you know, the, the way in which you relate these two, um, these two equations is through identities such that integral d3x of e to the um, i k minus k prime x. This is equal to basically a Dirac delta function. Dirac delta of k minus k prime. Or if you want to say the other way around, d3k over 2 pi cube e to the minus i k x minus x prime. This is equal to Dirac delta of x, Jesus, this, <laughs> x minus x prime. And I believe everyone here knows this, but the purpose of writing this is that I'm establishing here a notation. Because many, many times people write Fourier transform with factors of 2 pi here or there, and the volume factors are somehow messed up. In cosmology, at least in large-scale structure, CMB, everybody uses, uses this, uh, this uh, notation here. Okay? So they put the 2 pi cube here in the 3K. And, and you use this. OK, so this is just, of course, I know that you guys know this, but it's just establishing notation here. So uh, also, a note about dimensions here. Because sometimes you're doing calculation, and you're lost, and you've done a mistake, and you realize that things have the wrong dimension. That's a very good way of checking if you're doing the calculation right. So you know that delta has no units. And therefore, this delta tilde, because it's an integral d3k, this is dimensionless also. This is, this is dimensionless, this is dimensionless, this is, has the dimensions of volume. So the, the, the units of delta are volume. OK? So this is something that, if you keep in mind this, then things uh, you can make dimensional analysis at the end of the day. OK, so now, what can we do this, with this delta here? So statistics of the 
density field. Okay? We already know that the mean of delta of x, okay? I'll lose the t here, okay? I'm keeping the t all the time. I'm getting tired of writing the t's all the time. Unless otherwise specified, I'm always taking any kind of expect, any kind of, uh, when I, whenever I write delta, it's delta of, of, of t. And all the deltas, even for different x's, different positions, they are at the same t, okay? So we know that this is zero, okay? So this is the, this is what we call the, uh, if you want, the one point function here. The first momentum of a field which has some properties. Now, we can also ask what is the mean of something like delta of two points. I can, also, I can always assume that the points are the same point, but this is sometimes not a completely well-defined um, thing, because how small do you want to make a region where you regarding that point? And if you make it arbitrarily small, you will find that very often, even for perfectly physically sensible uh, systems, that this can be, go to infinity. So we take them at slightly different points. So we ask, what is the mean distance between two? Uh, what is the mean of the density in one point and the density in another point? Of course, the way that I draw in there, I, I used a peak here and a peak there, but what you should do here is to take the density everywhere and multiply by the density everywhere displaced by a certain displacement to the left, to the right, up, down, all directions, and so on, right? This is what we call here, okay, this two-point function here is what we call the correlation function. Now, if we believe that the universe is homogeneous, okay, so this here is a mean over all the positions x. So it really, turn, you turn this into basically some sort of a volume integral. The x goes away through that integral, but this stays there, okay? So if the universe is homogeneous, if the distribution of matter is homogeneous, then this correlation shouldn't be sensible to each point x. They should be only sensible to how distant those two points are here. So if you have a short distance, a large distance, and so on, okay? So this is the two-point correlation function, okay? So two-point correlation function. I think I'm, I believe I have a, an imaginary line here that I shouldn't cross, right, Antonino? There's a, there's a new system. So. There's a new system, actually. This, this is the new system. Oh. With the new system, this is not a problem anymore. So this is a two-point correlation function. Of course, you don't necessarily want to stop there. And there's, very, there's a lot of research being done these days to, uh, to go beyond this. So you can imagine that you can have delta of, let's say now, x, delta of y, delta of z. OK, so these are, this is called a three-point function. And let's, I'll just call this uh, something like uh, b here. And now I'll just say. Right, uh, the way that I wrote here, it's uh, x, y, and z, but again, if you impose homogeneous anisotropy, then let's say that y is equal to x plus, uh, let's say, r1. Let's say that z is equal to x plus r2. Then this should be a function just of r1 and r2. Um, by the way, if I really have homogeneity and isotropy, this r here shouldn't make any difference whether I have the distance between two points in this direction or that direction or that direction. So this perhaps should even go to something that only depends on the distance, not on the orientation, right? Only the, on, the, on, the, on the absolute value of that distance. And then you can go on from here. So basically, in this case, you have one point. In this case, you have two points, and this is r here between the two points. And in this case here, you have three points forming a triangle. And then, of course, you have this guy, this guy. And then, of course, since they form a triangle, this guy is given implicitly in terms of the others, so you don't need to repeat that information. 
So this, uh, otherwise it would be redundant here. Now, okay, so this is in real space, okay? So this is in real space. Or real or configuration space also sometimes we say. Now, let's say that we do this, but now uh, not in configuration space, not in real space, but in Fourier space. Let's make some calculations here. There are a preamble for, let's say, more intricate calculations that we're going to do later. OK? So. Professor, can I ask a question? Me. Oh, yes. Uh, you said that you're not writing T because Everything is at the same t. Yes. But when you're observing things that come from different distance, so t okay. is also different. Two right? things. Uh, these guys have a t here, and of course this guy would depend on t. Now, yes. What if you do a correlation between a galaxy and a galaxy at another time? Huh? Because what we observe in the universe yes. are things which are in different times. Yes. So. This is a good point. You have to, in some sense, correct for the expansion of the universe if you want to make a statement. Or you can make a statement directly in, um, in your light cone. So you can then you lose this, uh, this homogeneity, because now you have uh, symmetry on, uh, on the angle, but not on the radius, because the radius is basically your past light cone, right? And then you have, and then, uh, and then this has to be, now you have to state where uh, these distances are. So this R here, now it is important also you have to specify the, the direction of that, if it is along the line of sight or not. So that's a good point. That's when you, that's one of the cases where you can say that you lose this homogeneity, because your observation is in the past light cone, and then your correlation function will also be on the light cone. So you don't observe that correlation function directly? Cause no, in real life, we never observe something which is, let's say, a perfect homogeneous anisotropic. We don't take a, we, we, we are never able, uh, as you could actually also see from uh, Merdad's lecture yesterday, what all our observations are over the past light cone. We don't have the possibility of taking a snapshot at a given time of a physical volume of the universe. We don't have access to that information. What we can observe is that things which are a certain distance at a certain time things which are farther away at an earlier time, and so on, and so on, and so on. So when you, when you correlate galaxies, unless they are exactly at the same redshift, when, right? When they are the same redshift, then it's fine, because they would be at the same time. But if they are different redshifts, then you're already talking about objects in different times. So there, there are ways to correct this, let's say, approximately, so that we can effectively work as if you were on a, on, on a fixed time for all the galaxies, but these are all approximations. They are subject to you know, different modelings and so on, so they are the model dependent. OK, good question. Yes? Uh, the density field is a function of uh, x and time. But uh, yeah. uh, then we imagine uh, amount of uh, mass divided by an amount of volume. But, uh, uh, my question is, we stay looking for fact on point in the space, in the space of the universe, or this is implicit in your analysis on on Sorry, I, I missed, uh, I missed uh, uh, something in the middle of your phrase there. If I looking for what? Uh, looking for, uh, in fact, a um, point of the space because the, the density field is a function of the, the point, uh, is a function of the x. But uh, we stay taking account the, the homogeneity and the isotropy of the universe. So my, my question is, the, the density field is, is uh, a function of the, the point of the space? It's a function of the point, yes, of yes. course. But we need like a fluid. A fluid, if you say that at a given point it has a certain density, energy density, pressure, whatever, that is the statement, right? Yes. But we need to take into account the, 
the cosmological principle of the homogeneity and isotropy, then we need to uh, look only for... Uh, Again, say, so say this is equal to some uh, something which is the cosmological principle, if you say that it has to be absolutely valuable, va uh, valid and no deviation from it, then you just have this. The point is that this is not true necessarily, that you have some deviations here, which are small initially, okay, but they become larger. And if you look at this delta rho, if you make an average, say, look at the universe on very large scales here, okay? So take a box here of, say, I don't know, 100 megaparsecs on the side, okay? Take a cube here, and you make an average here on that cube, okay? Now you make this in this cube here, in this cube there, in this cube here in the universe, all cubes of the same volume here. And then you ask, what is the variation, okay, of this row in the cube here, row in the cube, row in the cube, which is the mean of this here over this whole cube. And you ask, what is the variation between the densities there? And the variation will be very small, okay? So this will be, so the uh, row cube will be rho bar plus some delta rho cube here for each cube now. Let's see an index, index y. And this thing here will be very small even today. This will be 10 to the minus 3, something like this, even today. Okay? Now, if you go, if you say that this cube is not 10 megaparsecs, sorry, not 100 megaparsecs on the side, but let's say 10 megaparsecs, then this is not true anymore. Because on 10 megaparsecs, you'll find in some regions you are in the middle of a void where the density is basically zero. In other places, you are within some galaxy cluster where the mass is like 10 to the 15 solar masses. So the variations are huge. Okay? So the cosmological principle is just something that orients your equations and it tells you how the universe behaves on large scales. On small scales, of course, the universe is not homogeneous and isotropic. And each point has a different density. Okay? So thanks for the question, because this clarified a little bit what I mean by homogeneity on what scales. Even today, the, homo the universe is homogeneous and isotropic approximately, but only on very large scales. But if you look at very small scales, then of course, you know, what is, what is it? anybody knows here what is the mean energy density of the universe? Ballpark? In grams per centimeter, per centimeter cube. Come on, guys. I'm sure one of you know. Just ballpark, I mean, order of magnitude. Don't, don't, you have, do you, don't you even have to get the right, exact right number. Something like this. So in grams per centimeter cube, what that would be? Just to complement this. About 10 to the minus 30 grams per centimeter cube, okay? So I'm certainly a 10 to the 30 fluctuation, okay? It's not much more than that. So the universe is certainly not homogeneous and anotropic today on the scales of me. Even the scales of galaxies, even the scales of clusters of galaxies, you really have to go to, you know, 300 million light years across to get, you know, to look at the universe on uh, what we call coarse-grained. If you average out the universe on that, those scales, then, of course, then the universe becomes approximately homogeneous and isotropic. Okay? But on very small scales, of course not. But then that is exactly the point of seeing how this goes on, because the universe started in, in a way that even on very small scales, even in scales of kiloparsecs, it was homogeneous and isotropic. But then these the structure formation created over densities and under densities, and on small scales, it became very, non, uh, very inhomogeneous. Those inhomogeneities grew in mass and in size. Today, the universe is homogeneous only on scales which are relatively large, hundreds of megaparsecs. Okay, so that's one of the things we had to describe, how the inhomogeneity grew from small scales, small masses, to large scales and large masses. This, what people call the hierarchical structure formation model. You start small and you grow big. Oi, yes.
What do you mean by small now? Let's be careful. I know what I mean by small or large in the people that I work with. I don't know what you mean by small. Because if you go to small like me, then it doesn't even make any sense to be talking about correlation function because it has nothing to do with the physical process that we study in cosmology. When I say small in cosmology, I mean down to, say, a couple of megaparsecs. That's what I mean small. Large is as large as the observable universe. You know, a billion, uh, uh, one gigaparsec, you know, three, five, ten billion light years. Okay, so that's large. Now, it is true that you are, when you make a galaxy map, you're looking at galaxies on different redshifts and on different times, and this is a complication. So on one hand, we, we want to calculate correlations on large distances also. On the other hand, when you calculate on large distances, we're taking objects at different times, so it's difficult to do, but this is a bit too much complication for now. For now, we can assume that we're going to be looking at the same time in a volume which is small enough that you can consider all galaxies to be in the same time, but large enough that we can look at the shape of the correlation function on different scales. Is that okay? And then we can later on start to correct for this as we get better at doing this job here. Is that okay? Yes? It's just a... When you define the two-point correlation just, just one question. Antonino, at what time I should finish? Like now, right? I don't want to do like yesterday where I completely hijack everybody. Huh? Six minutes ago. Uh, six minutes ago. So uh, you, I have to finish just one little thing here. Yes. Can I ask? Go. OK. So when you define a two-point correlation function, you said that there's a reason why we can uh, assume that it does not depend on the direction. Of R, if but you have only... homogeneity, then if you have no preferred directions, then it doesn't, mean, doesn't matter if R is pointing this way or that way or that way or that way, then all the, all the orientations should be equivalent. So it doesn't depend on the, uh, it only depends on the, on, on the modulus of R, not on the direction and sense. Okay, but you, in, in what regime you're assuming homogeneity? I, I, maybe I don't understand what you mean by homogeneity here. If there are no uh, homogeneity means that on any scale there are no preferred directions. That's what I, that's, sorry, isotropy here. There are no directions which are preferred, then there is no that preferred direction that any correlation function would point to. If you found that a correlation function has a preferred direction, then this would break isotropy. And that is in any scale. Now, in hom homogeneity, uh, we can say that it's broken on small scales, right? We, we are here, the solar system, the galaxy, etc. But isotropy, of course, there's no indication that it's broken anywhere. Of course, if you look only at Earth or the solar system, there's no isotropy. There's the plane of the ecliptic and so on. But cosmologically speaking, there is no preferred direction. If there's no preferred direction, then the correlation function should not depend on the direction of that big R there. That's it. OK? Now, uh, let's back, get back here. and. I really didn't say much about the correlation function. Uh, so let's say here, let's do this in Fourier space. So let's begin with this guy here, right? So what is this delta of k here? And of course, I also mean delta of t here. By the way, just making a Fourier transform on a field would imply that you have that field at a fixed time. By the way, doing a Fourier transform means that you're putting your field at a fixed time, and then you're integrating over some volume. So there you go. In this case, you can only do this in the approximation that you have all the deltas in the same time, and all the positions, right? So we know that this here, you can, you can also do this. This is basically integral d3x of e to the i k x delta of x here, right? Now this, int this mean over volume, uh, this mean here. And of course, you have the uh, mean of this object here in the sense that you are making another coarse graining on a different scale here. And this mean here is going to be 0, so this is also 0. Just by the fact that this, the, the, the mean of this object has to be 0, that then this means that this integral also has to be 0, if that mean is 0. Now, uh, what is this here, however? This you can think about what it means to have a, a mean of an object in Fourier, in Fourier space. Uh, in, in that sense now, it's better not to think of, 
of the mean in terms of any volume integral, because in Fourier space is not a volume integral. In Fourier space, this is just, uh, you can think of about this as either an integral over the space in Fourier space, or you can think about this as having a random field and have a realization of this random field. So this would be a sort of an expectation value that is the same thing, basically. Um, so the one-point function has to be zero. Let's look at what the two-point function has to be now. So instead of having one-point function here, you have two points, let's say k and k prime here, right? Now, this now becomes the expectation value of d3x. So let me make this calculation here very quickly for you, okay? kx delta of x. Then, so this is uh, delta of k. Now, delta of k prime is another integral here. Delta of x prime. OK? Now, if we take this expectation value, and now it's useful to think about this, these brackets here to be expectation values, pretty much like you have in quantum mechanics here. That's the most useful way of thinking about them. The exact definition, I think we can come back to this later. But this is then, we can move this out of the integral. These will act only on these objects here. So this is these two integrals we can get out here, d3x prime. Then we have e to the i k x i to the k prime x prime. Then what we have here is expectation value of delta of x, delta of x delta of x prime, okay? So, now, what is the eraser? Erasers here. Now, okay, so what is this now? This expectation value, in that sense, is basically what we got here is this correlation function here of r, which in this case is basically x prime minus x, right? So this delta of k, delta of k prime here becomes just an integral d3x, d3x prime, then Let's write it like this. So I can have i k x, i k prime. Then I write here x prime. I write as r plus x, OK? Now you see that what we can do here is that we can have uh, we can have two integrals here because now we don't need to make the integral over d3x prime here. We can change this to uh, an integral over d3r. The integral over d3x here comes out here, so you have this term here and that term. You can separate these two integrals. You have one which is d3x e to the i k plus k prime x. And then the other integral, which is the same here, of course, right? If I take this integral here to be the variation of x prime or r, it doesn't make any difference. So I make the integral over r here. And this is just e to the i k prime dot r times the correlation function now. Now something very interesting happens. First thing is that, you know what this is? We showed in there, right? What is this first term here? 
is a Dirac delta. It's actually 2 pi cube Dirac delta of k plus k prime. And what we have here is the Fourier transform of the correlation function, which is called the power spectrum P of k prime here, OK? Now, P of k prime, because of this delta, P of k prime or P of k is the same thing, because deltas have that, uh, you know, the reality condition. So now we find that these, uh, this two-point function in Fourier space, something very interesting happened here. Uh, I didn't do the most, most general thing that I could for these uh, correlations between the, uh, between the density field, but uh, in this simple scenario, at least, that I showed you here, you see here that, uh, and another way of writing this thing is actually, which is more common, that you will see more frequently, is that if you have delta, sorry, I forgot to say here, I forgot to put the tilders here, okay? Another way to say this, another way that we can write this is that delta of k delta star of k prime, because delta of minus, so you change the k to minus k, this is equal to 2 pi cube delta Dirac of now k minus k prime, so you just exchange k to k prime, and then you make them equal, and the reality condition means that p of plus k and minus k is the same, so you just take p of k here. And what you find is that these modes here, so the modes, p, uh, sorry, the modes delta of k delta of k prime, if you want, if you, if you will, are uncorrelated. And, of course, when they are equal, apart from some Dirac measure, the variance of this field here in Fourier space is given by this p. So this is what you're calculating now with Merdad in Fourier space, which is the simplest way of doing this, is calculating the variance. So this is what's important here. And this is, not, it, this is critical not only for the calculations in inflation, but also for large scale structure, that it's a very simple way of looking at things, that P of K is the variance of the Fourier modes delta of k. OK? More than this, that this is the one-point function. This is the two-point function. And we can make the statement that if the three-point function if the three-point function is zero, and in many cases it will be, for reasons that you will see in this lecture, and if the two n-point functions are all written in terms of the two-point function, just like a Gaussian will have the two n momenta all completely equivalent, given in terms of the second moment of the, or the variance, if this is the case here, and, it, and to a very good approximation, we know that this is the case uh, both in the initial conditions and in the late universe, then, in some sense, the probability of some mode delta, of you having a certain mode with some amplitude here, delta of k, is proportional to something like e to the minus one half of delta of k square over this power spectrum here. In some sense, if you get, if you find a map of the density field, take the Fourier transform and ask yourself what is the amplitude of that mode, not the phase. Look, these delta here are complex numbers. They have a phase, but they have an amplitude, right? If you ask what is the amplitude of that mode, it will give them, be given basically by some 
something like this. And the reason for this is really beautiful, and it comes out from the calculations that Merdad maybe is going to do today, that tell you that, you know, it's like, what, what else have you encountered in your life that has the probability density which is a Gaussian? Huh? Well, the same be sure. But think about, go back to your undergraduate years. What has properties of, uh, let's say, a probability, which is Gaussian, something that you have calculated in second, third year of your undergraduate? Well, it goes into black, but it's even more basic than this. What is the first quantum mechanics problem that you have solved in your life? Harmonic oscillator. What is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator? Is basically a uh, Gaussian um, distribution, right? It's e to the minus one half of x squared, if you want. And as Merdad is going to show you, basically the fields that give rise to the density perturbation of the universe are, to a very good approximation, harmonic oscillators in their ground state. So it's all kind of connected, all right? And this gives us an idea about what kind of power spectrum we expect. We also, we don't know anything about the shape of these guys here, right? Shape of this guy, right? I showed you the shape of this correlation function here, which is something like this. I showed you the shape of this power spectrum here as a function of k, which is something like this. I haven't said anything about the shape here, but I gave you some very important properties that tell you something about Gauss, about Gaussianity, homogeneity, isotropy, it's all in here, all right? What we'll do from now on is to solve the equations for delta that will then inform how we change the way in which we calculate these, uh, these quantities, these correlation functions, okay? And now I think my time is totally over, and I'll stop there, thanks. <laughs> We can also leave the questions for later on in the discussion session, so, uh, so I don't take much more of, of your time now. Huh? Let's do this. Is that okay? Yep. We leave the questions for the discussion later? <laughs> cool. Yes. All right. Okay. Thanks.